you guys. I'm so stupid. Like I went live from my account, which is why Stuart couldn't find us. So I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to now try this again. And now, of course, now he's not by his phone. <laughs> because I was talking so long and rambling on about my crystals. Anyway, let's try this again. Give him a few minutes. Welcome to Earth Hour. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> this is the show where we chat to ordinary people about out of the ordinary things. Um, sorry that your host <laughs> is so silly today. Really apologies. Um, let's try. <laughs> Let's try and just get Stu on again. Oh my god, I just want to laugh at myself. This is ridiculous. <laughs> but at least I got to speak like for a whole half an hour um, about my crystals. <laughs> oh gosh, here we go. Um, so... We're talking to Stuart today Hello. from uh, Hi, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's all good. It's all good. It's such a it's such a beautiful thing because the crystals will teach us no matter what. They'll create opportunities for us to grow. And so I was busy chatting to somebody now and saying, you know, because uh, on the weekend, you know, with all this live stuff, um, on the weekend they did a, like a live yoga class. And what happened was the teacher, like their connection failed, so they got disconnected. But then all of the students, because they know the teachings and they know the practice, they all just decided to do it themselves. And so what you said about now how you were speaking about crystals for half an hour, I was telling my friend exactly that. I said, I bet you if this woman lives in the heart, she's going to sit there and talk about crystals and she's going to hold the space for that. And then when the time is right, when our nerves are done, we'll be back and ready to have a proper conversation. Oh, you know, you know the universe and the crystals so well. So I've been sitting here and, yeah, showing people my crystals. <laughs> So they obviously okay. wanted to be in the show as well. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, Stuart. Yeah. Thank you so much for your Thank patience you. and your beautifulness. Thank you so much for joining us. So please yeah, you you tell us um, more about yourself. Where are you from? Um, yeah, who are you? Who am I? <laughs> Big question. Um, no, so I suppose I can. I live in Midrand. I stayed just around the corner from you guys at Earth with Yoga. Um, I was very fortunate that I grew up in, you know, in Midrand in a time where there was, you know, not much development. It was very, very like natural still. There was no waterfall. You know, Mall of Africa is pretty new. It was all open land. And so when I was a kid, I used to be able to walk for like 10 kilometers through the felt land, right in the central heart of Midrand, and it would just be open felt. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we, ha we were very blessed with, uh, here in Vorna Valley specifically, we, we, we're known to have servals and civets and, and occasionally caracals when I was a kid. So we used to see these things running around in the bush around here. Um, and, you know, something that I always used to do when walking out in the felt was I'd pick up little rocks, little stones. Um, I feel like there's this anecdote that every uh, South African, like our, around our age, has that, or maybe every age, that they go on holiday somewhere and they go to a flea market and there's a scratch patch. And, you know, people dig around in the scratch patch and they find their treasures in that. And, um, you know, I think everybody's probably got like a little collection or maybe they've lost it somewhere along, uh, you know, along the road of these stones. And it's really wonderful because when I was a child, I wanted to be an archaeologist and a geologist. And I never, like, I never really understood why, because I, I'm a smart person, but I've never really been that dedicated towards, you know, being academically clever. Um, and so it was so wonderful for me, you know, later in my life, when I discovered the, the healing properties of stones and uh, the different types of spiritual pathways that one can walk and that are closely, you know, connected to the stones. And then, you know, realizing that actually this passion that I had as a child for geology was really a strong resonance with the crystal healing practices and with the whole archaeology thing. Um, it kind of evolved mm -hmm. into uh, understanding of anthropology and, and wanting to explore different cultures and different traditions. And, uh, you know, some people would even say that I, you know, I had a really strong connection to ancient Egypt when I was a child. 
And, you know, one of the most profound cultures that used crystal healing, at least in our recorded history, um, was Atl- I mean, was uh, Egypt, you know, where they used to put uh, golden masks on their dead full of lapis lazuli and all sorts of crystals like that. Oh, and wow. so it was really, really beautiful. Mm. And, you know, giant temples, we don't, what we see of the pyramids today is not what they were in their glory days. They were covered in white limestone with gold caps on the top that when it was, you know, in the sunlight, it, it became alive. You know, I don't know if you can see here uh, with this light on my shoulder. Yes. It's so wonderful to, to see light play. And I just, I, I look at these ancient cultures and how they worked with light technologies um, and, you know, monuments and things like that as, as spiritual work and as, as conscious energy tools. I get so excited. And so I guess part of my passion is being able to follow, the, you know, go down the rabbit hole, if that makes sense. You know, the rabbit hole of the crystal world. Because there is in so many cultures and so many different traditions, we, you know, we work with crystals and gemstones and all of those different types of things. So, you know, part of my passion uh, with creating a space and creating a shop to share this is so that I can go down that rabbit hole further. Um, yeah, it's, I, you know, I, I feel like uh, certain things in your life you could get bored with doing. And I really am constantly reminded that it's impossible for me to be bored doing what I do because I think, oh, I know all the stones. And people often say, oh, Stuart knows all of the stones. All of them. And, and then every, every day I learn a new one. Every second day I learn another two. And there's always new minerals kind of popping up into my reality. So I'm so blessed and excited to be able to kind of live from a perspective of, of crystals and, and the earth. And, you know, with you guys being earth yoga, I know you know what it's like to be grounded and really solidly connected to the earth. Um, and I guess crystals is just my real passion, you know, as to how I connect with the earth. Beautiful. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm not sure, uh, you know, if anybody knows, but in Midrand, I have a shop. So we've yeah, just recently opened a shop. shop. You've just recently opened and then lockdown happened. Yeah, so we, I was open for about two or three weeks, and then the lockdown happened. Um, so it's been a really, really beautiful opportunity because those um, who have really needed stones or needed to work with the stones, we've kind of provided a platform for that. Um, but it really is, it's been such a challenge because it, it's, uh, you know, having a crystal shop is not just about selling stones, it's also about holding space for what needs to happen. And so, you know, like our experience this morning about the way, like how this all played out, it's a beautiful reminder that that constantly we're holding that space for the healing to happen for ourselves and other people. And, you know, so even with the shop being closed and without, you know, being able to physically engage, I feel like the, the, the stones were bringing up teachings for me. Yeah. Um, you know, in the, first, in the first week I was clearing some plants and it was so interesting because the, the one tree, I was busy rooking the tree um, with a spade, trying to get an invasive plant out the bottom and, uh, the tree saying, no, you need to be like, mm. really, you are, are you hurting me? You know, I was pulling and it was pulling on everything. And I said, no, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to save you from this invasive species, uh, this plant. And it, you know, it just keeps reminding me, no, 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 just relax, be careful, be gentle with us. Mm-hmm. And I pulled, sorry, I'm getting dings. Um, and I pulled and the spade got pulled out of my hand and it actually flung into the, he- the air and hit me on top of the head. And I cut my head open and I was in the hospital in the first week of lockdown already, blood pouring down my face. Oh my I went into gosh. the veterinary clinic and there was full of people and I was just spraying blood everywhere. So my mom said, no, you're not an animal. You can't come in here. Um, but it was beautiful <laughs> because I went. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I went to the clinic to get it patched and I was sitting there and I was just thinking, you know, I basically said to the tree, don't worry like how rough I am because it's for your benefit. It's for your good. You'll, you will heal. And I was sitting in the nurse's room and they were busy um, like stapling my head. And I just heard, like I just felt these trees laughing and saying, don't worry because they had to cut my hair or like there's a bald patch at the back. You can see I like it. Um, and you were like, and so they, so just, it's hurting me, it's hurting me. <laughs> Yeah, and the trees just kind of laugh and say, oh, no, don't worry, my brother. It's all fine. It hurts a little bit, but you'll be, it's, it's for your benefit. Yeah. And it was just so wonderful because, like, in this time, um, with these crystals as the cent- central theme, um, it's, I've gone through this phase of wanting to poison this indigenous, like, this invasive plant and kind of just get rid of it because I don't want it to be like that. 
And then like through all of these different processes, some permaculture people gave me advice and so on. And eventually what ended up happening was somebody shared this uh, teaching from a permaculture person in Australia. And it turns out that this plant, as much as it is an invasive species, it focuses on um, allowing forest expansion. So, you know, where you see it's lantana. So where you see the lantana growing on the edges of big foresty areas, it's actually trying to prepare the soil for the trees to expand. And it was so interesting because he explained this invasive plant as uh, like the hardworking immigrants. And, you know, it's so funny because you look at all of the immigrants in the world, like people, and, you know, we, the, the, the Indians came to South Africa to process the sugar cane and that helped, you know, develop the infrastructure of the whole country. And so it was just beautiful to see how, even though I'm working with the crystals, I, you know, as a, as a shop selling these crystals, they are working with teaching me in the whole environment altogether. And so it was so beautiful to kind of come from the beginning of the lockdown of wanting to kill this invasive thing, then understanding how that invasive thing is actually preparing our, uh, you know, our infrastructure for what is to come. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, lockdown is exactly like that. I feel and like yes, um, the on a, it's, it's this invasive thing, but it has a purpose. Yeah, it's preparing us for what's to come. Like, I mean, this, just this, what we're doing now, I've never been the type of person who will be on, uh, you know, on live things. And, and I don't know if you are, but um, it's definitely encrypted. You know, and we're all becoming comfortable in the space of, mm. of being able to communicate like telepathically, but through this device. And, you know, so many other things, I feel like it's allowed me, I've, I do live sales now where I always was against it because I want that personal interaction. I want people to come to experience the crystals, not just to watch um, a thing mm. about them. Um, and you don't like I could, I've got a like this here. Like this is a beautiful crystal, but you really I promise you you cannot see the truth of this crystal from the picture. Um, yeah. And so I really I really do feel like there's a there's a power behind uh, having the physical interaction with the stones, but it's really taught me how mm -hmm. it, it's not a time and place thing that it is about doing it always about living that always. And so I'm so grateful for the lockdown and for my shop to close because it's allowed me to, like I'm very bad at business, so it's allowed me to understand budgeting a bit better. It's allowed me to understand how to like allocate my resources and, and you know, these lessons that can really be extended onto the self because, you know, I don't, I'm not good at saving money. And so, you know, I'm not really, as much as, you know, we want to be present in the moment and so forth, I also have this disconnect from, from the, mo the next moment. And so it's taught me so much about that as well. So yeah, I'm, I, like, I'm just really, really grateful for the opportunity to live a life with crystals and just reflect on all of the teachings that they offer because it's not, I think a lot of us want these grand, like touch the crystal and feel it glowing and feel it like vibing through your whole being. But I think when you kind of come to attend, you know, to the perspective or have the attention to pay attention to how, when certain crystals come into your lives, like into your life, how it's manipulating and changing the way you experience everything else. Because I could look at this, you know, getting hit on the head with a spade as a bad thing, or I could look at it as a way of learning how to love better, or, you know, how to nurture better, or how to care for an environment better. And that environment not just being the natural world, but also my internal self. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's really, like, it's really amazing. For people that haven't really worked much with crystals and that are new to crystals, what, how, yeah. how do we use crystals? Oh, like, so for me, I really like language. So I feel like the first thing that we need to do is we need to take out that language of use. Um, because, and it's, it's very hard because we do, this is how we communicate and it's how we taught to communicate. This is a thing that we use for something. And I feel like something that we need to bring more into our awareness and into our practice, especially with the stones, is the understanding of allies. So, you know, an ally is not a friend. You know, yes, oh, I'm very friendly with this beautiful crystal, but it is uh, this consciousness or this being that we have or, or do make a contract with, make an agreement with, to assist us with certain things. And so with the quartz crystal, this quartz crystal, for example, this is a channeling crystal. You see that by the number of faces. You know, we can get so technical and into so many different things. And if you want to, whoever's watching, and whenever you're watching, you're welcome to come and we'll chat about that. But um, so it is, a, it's an ally that, when, I, when it comes into my life, whether it's through a gift 
whether I purchased it, whether like I've seen people finding stuff uh, in the strangest of places. Like a friend of mine just moved into a house and they found in the garden probably about 60,000 rands worth of crystals just lying in the garden for them. And so now they're going through this whole healing process with the stones. And I think by kind of changing the language of using this thing, we take away the perspective of a limitedness. So something that often people say is that crystals lose their energy or you need to cleanse them or you need to charge them. This is a very controversial perspective for a lot of people because as a tool, we need to clean it for it to work properly. But my understanding goes that when you bring it into your life as an ally, by wearing it on your body, by carrying it in your pocket, you know, people do strange things. I know with the girls, they put a lot of stones in their bras. Um, by taking 10 minutes a day and like lying with it on your heart or, you know, wherever you might be guided with your intuition to put it, is to understand that this ally is coming into your life to work with you. And I also feel like, so in my shop, I don't have any of the information about what the stones do about their different properties, because I know you, I've known you for many, many years, but the, the version of you I know is so different to the version that Malcolm knows, and is so different to the version that, you know, some of your students know, or some of your teachers know, and, you know, you are still you, but yes. everyone has this different experience of you, and so how can we even possibly write uh, information about a thing that is different to everybody? Because yeah. it is a being and it is a consciousness. And so for me, the first thing I tell people when I do a crystal workshop is I say, throw all of the books away. Because working with crystals is not about books. Because books and knowledge sits in the mind. And, and we've been taught to live in the mind. We think a lot. It's how we interact as Westerners specifically with the world. And it's, crystals work from a heart center. They work with feeling. And feeling is not a mind thing. It's a completely separate thing. And so what happens is when people start to work with the crystals, they want to read a book about it or they want to go and learn from somebody about it. They want to take an external truth to help them work with internal truth. I hear um, Like, yeah. And, and so like uh, one, of our, one of our mutual friends, the way that he works with crystals is he sniffs them. Like he'll come into the shop and, you know, sniff the stone. And it's, it's, it's like it's really, really weird for me. But for him, it's... Like his psychic senses are based here and the way that he experiences energy and receives the knowledge or the teachings or the growth or the energy work is by smelling. And so like I really choose, like I ask people to engage with stones in a way that, you know, don't do it like the book says, do it like what your heart says. And so for me, one of the ways I love to work with them is I, like for this one, it has a specific place that you can sit your thumb. I don't know how well you can see it there, but it's got a perfect space that it, it grips in my hand nicely and it sits in my thumb. And so, you know, if you want to go into the knowledge of it, the, you know, the, the chakras are not just the seven main chakras of the body. The chakras are in all of the body, you know, many different places. And I believe in the fingers too. You know, we do reflexology to connect to those points. And so by me holding it in a way of putting my thumb there, that is a way of the energy communicating with me. And I'll just sit there for, you know, while we're sitting here, holding it in my hand like that, and we'll be working on the subtle energies of my body. And uh, like these are, I guess, terminologies that if you don't really know a lot about crystals, you might feel uncomfortable in this conversation because you don't know what I'm talking about. But like I say, the essence is not to listen to what I'm talking about. It's to take the opportunity to create some time for you to experience what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It, I think for many people, yeah. we're so disconnected to what's going on here because we're constantly being taken out of our bodies that we don't yeah. know what the language is like hearing someone else speaking French. If you don't speak French, you're not, stuff fades in the background, yeah. right? So the bodies we kind of become like that. And talking about subtle energy, of course, people don't know what that is because we don't even know what we feel emotionally, never mind subtle yeah. energy. Yeah. And so like for me with the like to look at yoga, I really, really like I used to do a lot of Ashtanga with you guys and I loved Ashtanga. But for me, what happened was I kind of got into the mind too much because I needed to know what all of the moves were. So I was constantly looking around and trying to see what everybody else was doing. And I never really like I eventually did. I eventually did with my practice get into the pace where I'm not, care you know, I'm not paying attention to anybody else. I'm just flowing with that flow that you just created. And so for me, I feel like, you know, uh, yoga has a very structured f movement, 
but I, I remember when I came back from overseas, I came to some of your classes, and I think you were doing so so much something where you were just feeling what the body needed. Yeah, and for me, that's so beautiful because it's about like disconnecting from the mind and just feeling what your body needs. And so, like, if you want to work with crystals, do that. Disconnect from your mind in whatever practice it is. If you're a meditative person and you like to sit and breathe, bring the crystals into that. If you like to lie in the bath, bring the crystals into that. You know, people uh, who drink a lot of water, like carry a water bottle around all the time, put your crystals into that. But most importantly, listen to what your heart is saying and, and what it has to say about working with that. Because all of the books, that's all that those people did. Mm. And for me, yeah, the crystals are exactly. really important. Yeah. They listen to the heart um, and let the crystals speak. So if I have a bigger crystal, is it going to have a bigger effect on me? Or is a small um, crystal a size matter? Oh, that, that's a question as well. Um, the... So for me, I think size doesn't really matter. You know, that being said, when I stayed in New Zealand, we used to get these big crystals called earth keepers, which are basically like car sized quartz, so like this, but the size of a car. Um, and so when we used to bring those in, I would feel like I'd taken some kind of a hallucinogen or some kind of a psychedelic because the energy was so intense. But when you talk about like something like this big versus something like this big, I really don't see that there's a very big difference in, uh, in the way that you experience it. But if for your mind's sake, you, you feel like a bigger one is going to like affect you better, like in your belief system, if your belief system is from this place that says something that's bigger or something that has whatever de description, so um, it's shaped nicely, it's this right color and so on. So if that tells you that you have the ability to connect with it better, then that's great. But it's, you know, it's about how you engage with the thing. You know, we could sit here and experience a surface level conversation or we could go deeper. And it doesn't, you know, because I'm a bigger person or because you're a smaller person, it doesn't make a difference. It's just how we choose to meet each other. I saw a quote the other day and I can't remember the exact wording, but it was something like how you can only ever meet a person as deeply as you've met yourself. Yes. And so for me, I call that really specifically. Pardon? That's the spot on. That's the quote, word by word. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, I feel like crystals are the same. So if you have a small crystal and you know that that smallness doesn't change the personality of it or the energy or the presence of it, and you can engage with it on that level, then it is just as powerful as a car sized crystal. Because for me, I believe that they're almost like a gateway to the energy that is held within the earth. Yeah, so don't, don't, if you get a small crystal, like um, it, a lot of people might not have heard of it, but you get something called Moldavite, and Moldavite is based on, it, it, basically the Superman's kryptonite is based on that. So it's this beautiful alien green thing that comes from space, it's a magnificent thing. Um, and I've held pieces like this, and like a friend of mine, I put a tiny little piece, it wasn't even, too, like, wasn't even a centimeter, and put it on his hand and his whole vein, like the veins in his whole body were pulsating out of his skin. And when you took it away, it stopped. Oh my and God. so, the, 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 yeah, so, so it's a tiny thing, but what talks to him is that it's so different to him. He was a very earthy person, very well grounded, not so airy fairy up in the sky. And because the energy was so different, in his presence, it had such a big effect. And so it's really about, like, if you're a very red person, go and experience purples because it will teach you what it's like to be purple in a red body or something, you know? Yes, yes. Yeah, and yoga, we right. also say, do that practice that you don't like doing. <laughs> that's, yes, yes. That that's how we go. That's the one you need to do. Yeah, um, so challenge yourself is different. Hmm? So people are asking about the cleansing of the crystal. So you did mention and you said, you know, it's controversial. People have different views on that. Do you clean mm -hmm. your crystal? So the, it's controversial because I feel like there's, not a ne there's no necessity to that. Because even if you experience hell, that is teaching. If you go to the dirtiest place on earth, that is teaching. If you're allowed to be teaching. I don't like to be grubby myself. So I, de I definitely... Um, clean when it's necessary and, and, you know, keep a vibrance in it. But for me, the cleansing is really, so people cleanse by doing the full moon, people cleanse by smudging, people cleanse by singing. There's so many different things. But the thing that's important about that for me is that what it does is it helps you to create a practice. 
So you'll know doing yoga once a month is definitely not as beneficial as doing yoga three times a month. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to like doubt your practice because you only do it once a month, but it's about bringing yourself into doing it. And so my relationship with the crystals in terms of cleansing, I, I will use it as an opportunity. So I like to sing to my stones because I feel like with me, songs, when I'm really sad or when I'm really happy, songs have a massive capacity to change that. And so I sing to my stones. I even I, like I put a piano in my shop because people can come and play the piano and sing to the stones because the energy is beautiful about that. And so for me, I use that cleansing through singing to develop a practice, to develop a relationship. Because if, if I have a friend, so if I have an ally and I only call on that ally when I need it, I don't feel like that's a nice relationship. I feel like it's, um, it, you know, it's not nurtured. It's not cared for. And so then you're not really getting the deep value out of it. And so if you do the cleansing and you like the cleansing, don't do it out of fear because also with the crystals, you know, you get black tourmaline and you get all of these stones that people are seeking spiritual protection through. And what that does is it helps you get into a space of fear. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you're able to use the cleansing practice as something that develops your relationship with the stones rather than something that gets rid of the hojos because you're afraid to be dirty or you're afraid to, you know, to experience negative duality, then I think that you need to kind of observe why you do the practice. Yeah. It's like the touching of people. A lot of the time people say, don't touch my stones. And I, I understand that. And it's very important that we respect each other's boundaries about that type of thing. But in essence, for, for me, like my belief system says that even though you're like a couple of kilometers away on an energetic level, there is a communication. And so, you know, maybe the very outer limits of our auric field are busy chatting. Or like if you're in a yoga class, people are, you're all working together with the collective energy that's present. So whether you're aware of it or not, you, we're all constantly touching each other. <laughs> it sounds really terrible, but, uh, it, you know, it's, we have this uh, stigma about physical and this is my physical. And at the end of the day, this physical is really just an illusion about that's talking about all of the energy that's dancing together. And so if you touch somebody's stone with your hand, you know, from the perspective of the fact that we're all connected all of the time, is that very different from just having it with you and then somebody else near you? You know, we're all working with the energy in the space together. So, I, you know, I feel like people are, but there's a bit of hypochondria around, like, don't touch my stones, because they, they are going through this journey of finding their own personal space and developing their own boundaries and so on. Yeah. So you would say, if you want to clean your crystals and you feel like, oh, you want to sit and meditate in the moon with them, again, mm. tuning in intuitively, what's going to fit? There isn't yeah. one practice that's going to fit for everyone. You know, I no, everybody must you know, follow the heart. Yeah. Um, say that again. Say that. For beginners, any specific stones you would recommend to start off with? Um, maybe walk in the garden and see what you pick up, or would you say go to a shop, go in and buy a specific stone? Well, as a salesperson, I would say welcome to Spirit of Stone. You're most welcome to come and choose some beautiful stones from us. But, you know, for me, it's not important that it's a, sh a really shiny, pretty one. Something that we, in Joburg specifically, we're very blessed with is you get this, like, milky-colored stone with brown lines or red lines through it. And you kind of find that all over the show on the ground. And so the thing, that is hematoid quartz. It's quartz with hematite. So I don't know if you how well you can see, but on this side, it's very white. On this side, it's very glassy. Okay. So this white part is just um, not very high-grade quartz. Yeah. And so if you, if, you, if you are wanting to fiddle, yeah, so you'll see in quartz crystals, sometimes it's milkier and some, sometimes it's clearer. And so Joburg, all over the show, we have this hematoid, milk, like hematoid milky quartz everywhere. And hematite is all about balancing duality. It's about balancing the yin and the yang. And the quartz is, is uh, about having clarity and have, you know, bringing energy to that process. And so if you want, pick up one of those and carry it around with you for a week. And kind of notice how your week goes and then take it away for a week and see how your week goes and compare. It's like an experiment that you do with yourself. Um, if you are inspired to get a, a proper, like a proper crystal, um, I always, that's why I have this one here. I always suggest the quartzes. So not necessarily clear quartz, but amethyst, citrine, uh, rose quartz, I feel like is very overdone, but there is power to the teaching of it. If you're willing to understand it. No, is that rose? Yeah, you know. 
So no, so that's a hematoid quartz as well. That comes from the the free state. It's a beautiful piece. Yeah, um, but it's it, it's not too off. What that's was spirit that quartz? Spirit quartz. That one's spirit. I can't believe I forgot yeah, that. Sure. Um, and yeah. this one from Pretoria. Yeah, so this comes in a pl from a place called Buchenholz Kloof. It's just on the way to Wittbank out of Pretoria. Okay. Just yeah, so it. anything that's caught. Pardon? Carry on, anything that's caught. Yeah, no, so anything that's caught is really, really good for that because mm, they talk about quartz as being the master. There's rose quartz, yes. And they talk about quartz being the master healer. And so I feel like all of the quartzes have this energy or this wisdom in them that helps people to learn how to work with crystals. That helps people to kind of heal with the crystals. And so if you know nothing and you, you, know, you don't know how to go forward, is to just take a quartz and keep it with you. And just pay attention to how your life changes and see what happens because um, – it, it will happen. We just need to pay attention to how it happens and where it happens and not just expect this grand show of energy fireworks, but to understand that sometimes we've got to deal with the nitty gritty first. So I, I always say courts, but that's me. So in essence, I say, don't listen to me. Go to a crystal shop or go to a place and feel. Go and listen to what your heart is telling you because they do talk. You know, I, I'm sure most people that like crystals have, have heard the saying that, you know, you don't choose a crystal, a crystal chooses you. Yes. And so go into a crystal shop and allow yourself to be chosen. Oh, I need to come and see the shop now that it's done. I've only seen it under construction. Okay, mm -hmm. so what do the scientists say about all of this? I know... I don't know if you're very science-minded. Like, I have this computer side of me, a robot, that yes, wants to yeah. compute everything. And, like, do, are people doing studies on, on how crystals affect us and affect different people? Are there study, studies on prana, subtle energy? Do you know if, if anything is written on it for those that are... Uh, you know, yeah. I, you know, it's a very touchy subject because I think the field of what is, you know, called pseudoscience, which is just science, you know, it's just undiscovered magic, essentially, is, it, you know, they challenge it. But there has been quite a lot of research. So, you know, part of the fact that we have computers and cell phones and so forth is mainly due to the study of crystals. Yeah. So uh, there was a gentleman and I'll like when you post the video, I'll put a link because he's really, really fascinating, fascinating character, um, a guy called Marcel Vogel. And he worked for IBM for, for many, many years um, in the development of technologies. And they actually studied crystal matrices and the way that crystals grow and form together and how they communicate with each other in order to understand how to, uh, you know, build uh, microchips. And so people, a lot of people say, oh, we're in the silicon age and, you know, we're all in this computer thing. For me, it's we're all in the crystal age because a quartz crystal is, uh, if you take it to the molecular level, it's a silicon dioxide crystal. And so everything that is in a quartz crystal is used to create computers. Um, and, and for me, that's a technology. That's a magic. Um, but a lot of people won't uh, understand how computers work on, on the level of crystallography. So th they don't take it any further. But the thing that was really beautiful is so Marcel Vogel developed, he left IBM and he developed a couple of spiritual technologies where he would take um, optical clear quartz, so something like this, but that has none of the milky. And he would cut it into facets because he understood that a quartz crystal naturally forms in the ground as a hexagon. So there's always six sides on a quartz point. And he understood that by changing the structure of that, he could use it in a different way. The, he did these really magnificent experiments where he actually developed a technology to store JPEGs on, a, on this. So he used the quartz crystal as a drive. Um, and he, I think the experiment he did was a copy of the Mona Lisa. So he made this technology to plug into one computer and he uploaded the Mona Lisa onto a crystal and then took it to this other computer and plugged it in and he was able to extract it. And so uh, for me, I feel like in terms of crystal knowledge and crystal research, one of the first things that will probably evolve into, you know, scientifically, is the understanding that quartz crystals can store information. And so when we talk about the spiritual healing properties of quartz, we do. We talk about how it's programmable and we talk about how we can uh, use it together with our intuition because it stores an energy, it stores data. And so uh, there is a lot of research in terms of like color healing with crystals. So in the States and in, in Europe, you get these beds that you sit 
with a, almost like a light fitting above you. And it has, like at the bottom of, of you, it has a red light shining through a quartz crystal, and then it goes through the chakras. And they've done a, a fair amount of research in terms of how that works. And I'm not really sure in terms of, uh, you know, reference papers and things what I, you know, that I can put people in touch with. But there are different practices that are, you know, they're seeing how it affects things on a molecular level. Because it does work on a very, very tiny level. We want to do these experiments and see big changes. But I think it's very important that we kind of get our technology to the point where we're able to observe things on a much you know, smaller level. And we, we are. Like now they've got these really beautiful microscopes and you know, beautiful technology that takes us down to these levels that quantum physics talks about. And so I feel like in the next probably 10, 15 years, a lot more research will be done about it. And that being said, if, if, the, if the apocalypse is ever happening, and you know the whole thing about a solar flare happening, the sun shoots mm -hmm. off a big nuclear wave, radiated, radiation wave. If that happens, you go to Palaboa. You know Palaboa? They're like a place, I think it's in Mpumalanga or something. Palaboa, it's a, oh, like a game see. farm issue. So Palaboa is a really magnificent place because they have a lot of something called magnetite. And it's a natural magnetic mineral. And so the gravity there is actually uh, heavier. So if you stand on the scale here, you might weigh 50. But if you went to Palabora, you'd probably weigh like 80. What? Because the gravity is very different. Mm. And Why so something that? that I would... Because, of, like, because there's this, uh, you know, it's a very rich deposit of naturally magnetic stones. And oh. so, mag you know, we talk about... Yeah, so we talk about magnetic fields, like the auric field is just a magnetic field that we don't have a very good science in measuring. But gravity is something we've been working on for a long time. And so because there is this very dense gravitational field, uh, the radiation from the sun, which is just light waves, you know, another language thing we need to understand, radiation is just a light wave. Mm -hmm. 5G is just light wave and our bodies need to attune to the frequency of that light wave, you know, constantly vibing here. And so it's really interesting because the radiation that comes off of the sun, if you're able to, you know, generate a stronger magnetic field, you, um, you could be protected from the radiation because the, you know, the different levels of our atmosphere, the, I don't know what they, I don't know what they're called, but um, we have different layers of ozone. And each one of those layers is, is created by ma the magnetic field of the planet. And that is what pre you know, protects us from all the space junk. And so it is like there's so much, I suppose, knowledge that is based around minerals and crystals and things like that, that, you know, is, it is already science. So, you know, we go to space and what we put on our spaceships is gold. You know, they put pure gold leaf on those spaceships um, so that the radiation doesn't come through. And, you know, so for me, there is, a, you know, the science is just undiscovered magic. And we just need to look at the science that we've been using and understand how now, because it's normalized, it's not magic anymore. Mm. You know, we took a cell phone, which is a crystalline technology. If we took a cell phone back 500 years, they would burn us for being witches. Yes. Yeah, so it, it's really... It's really so, it's beautiful, but we need to kind of adjust our perspectives to understand. I mean, fiberglass, how, do you know how much stuff is built with fiberglass? Fiberglass is made out of mica, which is a mineral. Mm -hmm. So use it in so many different things that, like I said, they've just been so normalized that we don't see it as magic anymore. But once we have that technology to measure it on such a minute level, like in the quantum field, I suppose, We'll just, it'll just start happening like this. We'll just start to see how we are able to shift reality and change things with, with mm -hmm. crystals. Mm -hmm. Stuart, um, so would you say that the stones, like different stones have a different symbol or meaning? So Pumna was asking that she dreamt about the sky blue quartz and was given to her by her ancestor. Um, like, does that have a meaning if we dream of, of crystals? Because they might not just show up real time, you know, they, they sometimes show up in our dreams. Yeah. Or would so, it um, be with Pumla, it's very, very interesting. Mm. Yeah, so, so with Pumla, it's very interesting because she works with the ancestors. And so her ancestors are, you know, they're obviously very earthy people and very stone people, and they work with that. 
Um, and so when they communicate through things like dreams with that symbol, it, I've, in my experience, it's been a lot of different kinds of things. It's always a symbol because dream interpretation is, is often symbolic and we need to learn how to translate it. Mm. That being said, in the Sangoma traditions and in various other different shamanic traditions, we don't talk about dream as being metaphor. We talk about dream just being an experience of another reality. And so sometimes what can happen is when she, you know, for example, when she gets given something like that in a dream, it can be a medicine that they're telling her she needs to work with. Um, it, it, you know, that for me is what it's is what that is all about. It's about her not necessarily needing the physical stone, but understanding that that energy, because a, a crystal is just an, a very dense energy. It's a mm. solid vibrational energy uh, wave. And so when you get it in a dream state, when you get it on an energy mm. level, um, then I'm going to turn up the sound. Oops. Did we lose you? <laughs> okay, so if you guys have any more questions for Stuart, please post it at the bottom so we can see it and get your questions answered. I don't think we have much time left. It just cuts off rudely after an hour. Do you have the time there, Stuart? Are you back? You're still spinning. Yeah, so we have a question. Ooh, bloodstone. That's a great, good, good question. Um, so I've been playing this online game. <laughs> I have to collect these stones. I'm loving it. it feels so magically. <laughs> Um, so I'm just, we're waiting for Stuart to just come back on. I think he just put his phone on, do not stir. You're back. So, um, we had a really interesting question about bloodstones. Can you tell us about bloodstones? About bloodstones? Stone and I don't know if you've seen the alchemist, the full metal alchemist, the Japanese. Oh yes, the, like the philosopher's stone. Yeah. And um, now oh. I'm also playing um, Elder Scrolls online. Um, and there's also mm -hmm. lots of bloodstones, you know, and stones give effects to your shields and your weapons. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> please tell us more about bloodstones. So it's a, there's, you can, we can talk for hours, essentially. But so one of the things that I really, really like is um, in uh, Roman times, they used to wear hematite. Um, and hematite gets its name because it is iron, like what's in our blood. And so when a uh, hematite oxidizes, it goes silver. And so it's the reverse of our blood. And uh, when, it, sorry, yeah, no, so when it oxidizes, it goes silver. Where, when it, where our blood oxidizes, it goes red because it's blue in our veins and um, vice versa. So when it doesn't oxidize, it goes red. And so they used to uh, mm -hmm. believe that if you wear a uh, hematite in battle, you, it would protect you because you wouldn't get cut, so it wouldn't, you wouldn't spill any blood for having worn hematite. Um, you know, when you talk about the alchemical bloodstones, like uh, things like uh, for, for transmutation and changing the states of things, they all work with that. And it really, they, it, it, I honestly cannot express how stones are magic and how magic is possible with stones, how... Um, your reality is constantly shifting and in flux when you bring crystals into your life. And it just, it sounds like I love anime because, and games because they take the mind out there. And it's very important to understand that the only thing that's limiting our ability to experience those levels of magic is our belief system and our mental uh, perspectives. And so, you know, with alchemy, so, you know, King Midas, this, the guy that had the, that he could touch things and it would turn to gold. There is alchemy that works with doing that. And there are crystals that you can use to do that. Um, but a lot of it is very occult. A lot yeah. of those teachings are really not given to people that are just fiddling around. A lot of it takes, you know, you having to work with magics and crystals for, you know, 15, 20 years before they even start to show you those types of things. Because 
you need to be fully aware of like when we were talking earlier, we need to be fully aware of how subtle energies work. So, you know, for example, me, something that is very South African that I found when I went overseas is that we tend to finish people's sentences for each other because we feel like, oh, maybe it's just my thing, but um, we, we see this person is going to say this, so I'm going to say it. And what it does is it actually steals energy from that person and, get, and forces them to take yours or forces them to express yours. And it, it sounds silly because all you're doing is essentially interrupting the person with your perspective. But when you take things like that to an energetic level, like uh, a mother correcting its child, like, it's not like this, it's like this. That is forcing your belief system on another person. And the energetic exchange that happens in that uh, dynamic, I suppose, is really profound. And we need to learn how and learn to feel how we are taking and how we are giving of our energies. And crystals can teach us that. And so with working with the crystals, we will learn to master the flow of working with those subtle energies. It sounds like an imaginary thing, but, it, you know, it really is. I've seen... So one of the things I've seen at my place in terms of crystal magic is I used to have these big stone circles and it's all we're in big felt land here. And, um, you know, building a, stir, a circle kind of creates this auric field um, of crystal energy in a sphere type of thing. And we often get felt fires in Joburg. And what had happened was we got this felt fire and it had come down from off of the property onto our property and up. And it literally where the crystal circles were, I've got photos, I must find them somewhere. Where the crystal circles were, the fire burnt half into it, but did not cross that circle line. And it burnt half and then all of a sudden the fire turned around and burnt back over itself and went away. So it was like if the, if the fire was a living entity and it came to this place, it kind of was coming towards the crystals, burnt in a half circle around this crystal circle, and then was like, okay, well, I won't go any further, just around and went away. And, and so, you know, these things, the, that's why I'm so excited and so blessed, because the more you engage and the more you choose to delve into these practices and, you know, these understandings, the more it opens up to you. Because it is, it's like as, as we open ourselves, everything opens itself to us as well. And so when we are rigid with our belief systems and our practices, you don't have the potential to move forward or, or you know, away from, you know, what you have. Yeah. So there definitely, I, I couldn't tell you which one is the philosopher's stone or which one is the bloodstone, um, because they all are the bloodstone and they all are the philosopher's stone and they all have the capacity to do miracles. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's so profound. Yeah. So, so one of my passions is uh, with the Earthkeeper crystals, because it's, it has such a dense presence, I want to get six of them here on the property and build like a labyrinth around it so that people can come. And those who are not sensitive, because I don't know if you know anybody, but I know a couple of people that can't go into a crystal shop. Like they can go in for like two minutes and then it's too much and they have to get out. And so I want to create a place where people that are not that sensitive can come in and see, well, no, it's not just a bunch of hippies wearing glowy rocks around their necks. There is actually some kind of uh, tangible fabric to the energy of stones. Yeah. Oh, this you is know, fascinating. And, so that's, that's yeah, and I'm really excited about the future and, and where all of this is going to head to. So in yoga and mm -hmm. somatics, we learn that when the bone forms, it forms like a crystal. It's those geometric mm. shapes that's over each other and over and, and over, and that's how it grows. And uh, one of my mm. teachers and lecturers, who's a scientist, was saying that a human is a crystal, and I nearly fell on my back. I was like, I can't believe. But yeah, I guess people are really opening more to it, becoming more aware of mm -hmm. its power, their power. Yeah, no, and I think that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so somebody was also just asking that there is this white stone um, where they go horse riding. I guess that's also just some kind of quartz, like you were saying, all over Joburg. Um, yeah, so the same thing Joburg. in the garden. Mm. Yeah, Joburg. So Joburg is an amazing place. And I, the thing I really love being in Joburg because of our geology here. So the one thing that's really fascinating about Joburg is that we have an entire reef of gold underneath us, even though a lot of that's been mined. That's why we get such magnificent thunderstorms is because, excuse me, it's, it's drawing the energy from the sky down into the earth through that gold. 
And so uh, if you're really interested, it's really such a beautiful thing to kind of uh, explore the, geol uh, the geology of Johannesburg a little bit because we have a lot of um, granites and granite is essentially quartz with a, a couple of other bits and pieces in it. You know, the stuff that people put in their driveways, that gray stone with the white spotty stuff. Yeah. That, 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 is, that is quartz and that has an energy to it. It, has a, it holds a space. And so, you know, all of these things, like this person says when they go horse riding, it's literally, we are on top of all of the crystals all of the time. And it's really important to, become, to kind of become aware of where it is. Because, mm -hmm. you know, for us, in my tradition, when the Sangoma tradition that I work with, we believe that rocks are people. We believe that there are beings that are the rocks. And when you are specifically, uh, I suppose your attention is grabbed by one of them, you know, on a journey of some kind, it's important to go and have a communication with that. So if this rock has been jumping at this person, get off the horse and go and sit with the rock for a while. Go and, you know, whether you're conscious of your experience or not, go and allow that uh, attraction or that resonance to be fulfilled by an experience. Um, and that's why also I, I often have dreams of picking up stones on the side of the road and I go to where that place is and there's this big rock that I'm supposed to pick up. I've picked up stones that are probably 150 kilos and I'm not a very strong person, but that stone wanted to come and it made itself light to get in the car. Um, so magic. yeah, Joburg, the geology that we have here is magic. A Africa, we, I mean, the whole world is literally the moon, all of the other planets, our planet, are all made out of crystals. They're all made out of these crystals. And, you want, and people ask questions about how, you know, when Mercury goes into retrograde, what crystals is Mercury made out of? And when it's kind of moving through our auric field, what energy is that doing? I'm so fascinated by the fact that the planets and, you know, these, these giant collective you know, collaborations of different crystal energies are talking all of the time. We just got to listen. Yes. Get off our phones. <laughs> yeah, well, no, this is absolutely wonderful. You know, this communication is beautiful. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, the whole, you know, you get these, po these memes about people doing earthing, taking your shoes off and walking in the land. I think people need to do it more. It's like it's one of those things that's very... I guess popular in the spiritual community, but it's popular for a reason because our feet and our bodies are communicating with all of the minerals in the soil, in the plants, in the everything. And it's it, like, that is a way of us to get kind of closer to the communication of earth. I remember you don't wear shoes or are you wearing shoes now again? How many years have it been? Has it been? Um, so when I moved to New Zealand, I had to wear shoes for my job. Because nobody, you know, New Zealand people don't know what is a sangoma and, you know, why, you should, why you're not allowed to wear shoes and stuff. Um, so probably about seven years now, but with a year, like about a year gap in between. That's amazing, Stu. That's amazing. No, I was it's, talking it's, about the feet this morning and how cultures, some cultures, the Greek cultures, believe that the soul is, is linked to your heel. Um, okay to our feet and then we just prop it into shoes oh, yeah, for, for, hmm. like I understand because we don't like the city is a, is a whole different world to walk around in barefoot but I promise you you know if you go out into the rural areas people are running on the mountains through felt grass through thorn bushes through everything and they've just been doing it for long enough that their feet are, uh, are like accustomed to hard surfaces. So we all have really soft feet because we've been, you know, over caring for them. But if yeah, you get I mean, them out, they'll get used to it. Yeah, a natural foot would have like a hoof on it. So even the people in the outback, they don't wear shoes. The bush bushman people, yeah. they don't wear shoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they walk barefoot. Yeah. They have hooves. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, you know, so it's interesting. So if you have crystals, rub your feet with them, rub your hands with them, because that is like, for me, I like the metaphor of how, you know, people say you receive with the one hand and you give with the other hand. And that's almost like a flow of energy. So with this side, we bring into ourselves and with this side, we give out of ourselves. And with the feet, it's about like what we bring into our journey and what we put out into our journey. And so if you want, take stones and like, if so if you... If, 
especially with this, like the conscious community, we have a lot of people that let themselves get walked all over. And so, you know, taking a crystal, any crystal, whatever you feel attracted to and rubbing your left hand with it, it will help you to work with that relationship of how you receive things in your life and how you kind of allow people to do things to you or how, you know, how you experience your reality. And, and the other side, if you find that you are a domineering person or a manipulative person, take a crystal and rub the other side. And so there's so many different languages that you can use crystals to work with your body and with your being um, that if you really just start to do it, you, you, that more and more will show up. But, you know, the barefoot thing is, for me, it's wonderful because there is all of that in the earth. You know, we don't know what is in the sand. Have you ever seen those pictures where they, like, zoom in on beach sand and it's like all these tiny little shells? I, like, I don't know if that's true mm -hmm. or not, but it mm -hmm. fascinates me to think that it's very possible that when we're walking on the ground, we're actually walking on billions and billions and billions of tiny little awesome crystals like this. And they're all like vibing up through our body into our being. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so tell us now what you have in your shop. Um, are you selling so, online at the moment? I guess you're also closed or are you open? No, so I'm open now. I, can, I opened on Tuesday. Lucky um, you. I have been open. Pardon? Yeah, lucky me. No, with the, I'm very blessed with the traditional healer aspect of myself. I'm able to practice because it is essential. Um, so I have been open, just not like very open to the public. Um, I have started doing some live shows. So on a Sunday, I do a live sale from my Facebook page. Um, but yeah, I'm open. And so for me, I really feel like it's a, a beautiful thing to come into the space. If you've got time is to just come into the space whether you buy something or not is just to share some time together. Um, and, you know, to explore the crystals and see what they have to offer. I don't just do crystals. I do um, different kinds of plant medicines, different herbal remedies and things like that. Um, and, but, yeah, most, mostly stones all, of all different kinds, polished ones, rough ones, um, jewelry, and, you know, just slowly growing because I, I start humbly and I kind of have this big dream that I want to work towards. Hmm. Beautiful. Well done for taking the steps. Uh, do you have blue quartz? Pumla is asking. <laughs> Pumla, um, I will need to have a chat with her because there could be different. It could be different things, but she also needs to use the one that she was already given. Okay. <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah, and then people are just saying they need to see the shop. So can you please give us? Um, oops. Oops. <laughs> please give us the address. Okay. Yeah, so the address is number 8 LaRue Avenue in Warner Valley. It's just across, just down the road from Siemens. You you park at Warner Valley Animal Hospital, and then you'll see there's a big sign there. Warner Valley Hospital. Yeah, I couldn't remember yeah. the name. Um, so that person said I could let them from the horse farm and bring them home from the horse farm. They laugh at my, laugh at my but I can't walk past them without picking them up. That's the thing. That's yeah. probably how you know then that you're in tune to the crystals. They're calling to you. So follow that yeah. way. Follow that path. Yeah. So normally with us, if something from the environment is calling us, like if it talks to us, what we do is we'll go and sit with a little bit, sit with it for a little bit and see what it's calling us for. And if it is that calling to come home, then we normally do some kind of a prayer or a gift in place because, you know, this is a thing that was working there for so long that we just need to acknowledge the relationship changing. So, you know, if I pick up a stone from the side of the road, I'll either give a stone back because I've got, you know, I keep stones in my car um, or I burn like in pepper or sage or something like that to say thank you. Um, one of the things that's really good in my ancestral tradition is to sing a song for it to thank it for coming or to thank the space for, you know, the, where it comes from to, to, you know, to say this, ma this one is going now, but here is something in return. So it's, it's just about, because we have this capacity to just take, and some of us feel like it can be a good thing to take because it's, you know, we intuitively feeling the call, but we are also taking something away from somewhere and, and we need to kind of give and take in any exchange. And so I feel like it's very important that if you are taking stones from the environment, is to offer some kind of gratitude. You know, even if it's just a prayer, I like to give something back. It's your own practice. Yeah, because there's a lot of controversy also about, you know, how the crystals are being mined and that the earth is being harmed. 
so that the hippies can yeah. have their stones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there must be sustainable I'm, I'm, as well of mining or no? Are all yeah. crystals... So I'm, I'm, Sorry. I'm evil, but I'm also beautiful because I do, I am, my industry is destroying the planet. And so part of the thing that I try to teach is I try to say to people, don't buy a million small ones, rather save up your money and buy a bigger one, something that's got more potential. And don't just buy it because you think that you need it, because, you know, thinking.